Good evening, and welcome to our Galatians Bible study for this week. It's our seventh session already as we've gone through the book of Galatians. And tonight in our session, we're going to see that we reach really a pinnacle of Paul's argument in the book of Galatians, or a key moment in the book of Galatians when we reach verse 26, because Paul has been building an argument, so to speak, over these past several weeks. He's been calling us to understand who we are in Jesus Christ, and tonight, Paul is going to share who we are in Jesus Christ when he writes in verse 26 that we are children of God. And tonight we're really going to spend a lot of time unpacking what that means to be a child of God. Some of the benefits, some of the responsibilities, some of the great blessings that come from knowing that through Jesus Christ we are God's children. Let's begin our study tonight by looking to our Father in prayer. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that through Jesus Christ, you call us your children. And tonight, Lord, as we begin our study in this crucial passage of the book of Galatians, we pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding. We pray that you would impress these words upon our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me. Speak words that come by the Holy Spirit that remind us of the truth of who we are and that most of all, Lord, bring you glory, honor, and praise. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've talked already, just briefly, about this being the pinnacle of an argument. And I just want to take you back a little bit to show you how Paul has been making this argument. So if we turn back to the book of Galatians chapter 3 and verse 6, we'll see that Paul writes in verse 6, consider Abraham. And he spends several verses then talking about the promise that was made to Abraham. He talks about the faith that Abraham had. And then he begins to move on to what Pastor Don shared about last week, and that is the law. And the key person in the law is Moses. And then he ends by talking about the fact that the law is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So if we look at verse 24, the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. And so Christ is really where this argument is going. And then in verse 26, we see the, the final piece of this argument, or the pinnacle, so to speak, of what Paul is talking about. In verse 26, where we begin tonight, Paul writes, You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And if you have your Bible with you, if you're looking at it tonight as you're watching this study, I encourage you to highlight that key verse of Scripture. If you're not looking at your Bible right now, pause the, the study. Highlight that verse of Scripture. Write this Scripture down somewhere where you will remember it. This is an excellent memory verse of Scripture because it is the foundation of who we are as Christians. Through Jesus Christ and through our faith in him, we are sons of God. Now, some newer translations use the term children. We are children of God or sons of God, and that is because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And we're going to spend a great deal of time tonight unpacking all that that looks like. But let me just share with you a couple thoughts on that key verse of Scripture. First, from our study book, Sinclair Ferguson, this notion... The notion that we are children of God, it is the mainspring of Christian living, meaning this is the key. This is where everything flows from. This is where we find our identity as sons of God. So this is a crucial verse of Scripture. We're going to spend a great deal of time verse by verse here in the first couple minutes of this study. And I just encourage you to soak this in. Because this, this is a verse that we need to spend a great deal of time on. So, so as we begin, let's kind of break this verse down. Let's kind of see exactly what this key verse means. So it says, you are all sons of God. Now, the key word there is are. This is now who we are. This is now our identity. And as a son of God, Paul is going to explain to us later that we have now rights and privileges. 
And that's part of the reason that Paul chooses to use the word sons of God rather than children of God. Because if you understand ancient culture, you'll know that the son was the one who received the privileges, the inheritance. Women did not receive those things in, in the days that Paul was writing this. And so when Paul says, you are all sons of God, he is conferring this ability, this privilege, this heir on to all. All people who believe, he's going to say that in just a few verses. It's for the male and the female, the Jew and the Greek, the slave and the free. So this identity, this identity that brings with it a privilege is for all of us. You are all sons of God. That language is clear. It's not you might become. You are sons of God. And then we move on to this next modifying phrase, through faith. So we're not sons because of anything but our faith. We cannot earn this right. We are not born in to this. We accept it and become a son of God through faith. To those who believe, he gave them the rights to be sons of God. That's John 1, 12. It comes through faith. Now, remember, there was some tension between Jesus and the Jewish people about this. They, they were saying, well, we're sons of Abraham, and, and we're sons of the promise, and Jesus was telling them, it's not based on ancestry. It is based on faith. You are sons of God through faith, and who is our faith in? Our faith, of course, is not in ourselves. It's not in keeping the law. It's not in some other source or system. It is in Christ alone. And that's what Paul really is pointing out as the key to find sonship, is to find faith in Christ and Christ alone. It's abiding in Christ. It's finding our sonship in him. Others were saying that you become a son of God through keeping the law, and Paul was saying that's impossible. It only comes through faith in Christ. And then Paul begins to move on and, and, and really expound on this key verse of Scripture. In verse 27, he says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed, clothed yourself with Christ. And that image of clothing ourselves in Christ, Tim Keller does a great job of breaking down what it means to put on Christ and what that reveals about us as children of God. It reveals several things. First, it reveals that our primary identity is in Christ. We're putting on Christ. Christ is covering us. And so when the world looks at us, they should see Jesus Christ. Several years ago, I believe it was an Easter Sunday. My wife shared a song for special music, and it was entitled, Do They See Jesus in Me? As sons of God who have faith in Jesus Christ, who have been baptized into the faith of Jesus Christ, who have put on Christ, when people look at us, they should see Jesus. Jesus is our primary identity. It is not I who live but Christ who lives in me. It also reveals the, the closeness of our relationship with Christ. I, I just think about, and when we put on our clothes, they, they are right next to our skin. They cling to us. And, and several times when my kids were little, they wouldn't want to wear certain things because they would say, oh, Dad, it's itchy. It's itchy. It's too close. It's, it's itchy to me because it clung very close to them and closer right next to our skin and this putting on Christ reveals that our relationship with Christ is a close relationship and that is what really helps us find acceptability to God because if God were to look at us apart from Christ he would see us as we are sinners Worthy of judgment, because each and every one of us has broken the law of God. But when God looks at us, he sees us, so to speak, through the lens of Jesus Christ. He looks at us, and he does not see our righteousness. He sees the righteousness of Christ. Christ is the center of our relationship with God. He is the one who makes us acceptable to God, and we find a relationship with God through our faith in Jesus Christ. And so when we put on Christ, that becomes our primary identity, and that's what Paul's going to speak to in verse 28. 
Verse 28, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. You are all one in Christ Jesus. If I were to break that verse down or kind of summarize it, I would say it this way. I am a Christian before anything else. Christian, follower of Jesus, disciple of Jesus, however words or however you want to define that, we say Christian, follower of Jesus, disciple of Jesus, they all really mean the same thing. We should be that before anything else. Before anything else. Before we are Americans, we are Christians. Now, I know that might be a little bit of a hot-button issue. It might kind of rub some people the wrong way. And it's, I'm not suggesting that being an American is not an important thing. But we must be Christians first. And being Christians first means that divisions are gone in Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that we all have to be exactly the same. Male and female, there are two different people there. Two different groups, male and female. Females do not become males. Males do not become females. Jews and Greeks. Jews do not need to become Greeks. Greeks do not need to become Jews. Slave and free. We do not become the same. But it also means that we are united. And we should not be divided in the church over things like gender, class, and culture. We should not be looking down on other Christians that are different than us in terms of socioeconomic, in terms of race, in terms of gender. So men should not be looking at women and say, now we're more important than you are. And African Americans and whites, we should not be looking down on each other and saying, we're more important than you or you're more important than us. And when it comes to class, those who have been blessed with great wealth should not look at those who are scraping to get by and say, well, I'm a better Christian than you, obviously, because God's blessed me more. I must be more faithful than you. No, this should not be. We are Christians before anything else, and in the church, we must find unity. Divisions should not find a place in our fellowship. And that's really what Paul is saying in verse 28. In Christ, these things are gone because we are Christians first. We are all, all, all sons of God if we have faith in Jesus Christ. If we have faith in Jesus Christ, we are sons of God. And as Paul talks about this in this next section, then he's going to begin to talk about the, the responsibilities and the, the rights that are given to us in Jesus Christ. And so let me read to you this next section. I'm going to read beginning in verse 29, and we're going to read all the way through chapter 4, verse 3. Galatians 4, 29, 3, 29. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is, as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, he is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. So now Paul is going to begin to use this, this metaphor about an heir, about an underage heir. And we're going to call this section, Underage Waiting for Christ. So before Christ... Before Christ came, we were like young children. We were no different than slaves. And what were we enslaved to? Well, Paul uses this term. Uh, he talks about the basic principles of the world. And there's some different interpretations of what that means. But given the context, let's understand that to mean the law. So we were in slavery under the law. Even if we never heard of the law of God, even if you were Gentile in this time and you had not heard of the law, the law was your master, so to speak. And when you are under the law and you have no hope apart from the law, that is naturally going to make you anxious and burdened because as you look at the law, you begin closely to understand that you can never keep this thing. You can never keep this thing. And so you begin to get anxious and you begin to think, well, I can't keep this law. It's a heavy burden that I cannot ca carry. And, and we are waiting here, waiting for someone to rescue us from this law. And so at just the right time, Christ comes. At just the right time, 
Christ comes. We were in slavery. We were waiting for a savior. We are at this point without hope. And then listen to this beautiful verse that begins that we'll often read at Christmas time, but is a key verse for our faith. In Galatians 4, 4. But when the time came, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive full rights of sons. We were powerless to save ourselves. But in God's great and wonderful mercy, he came. He came at just the right time, at just the right moment in history. And there's so much that we could unpack about that, that phrase, just the right time. Christ came at this time when communication was able to be spread over a larger place. Christ came at this time of desperation, when people were longing for someone to come and set them free. Christ came at just the right moment when God had ordained it from eternity past. Christ came. Christ came and he was born under the law. He was born to a woman and he was born with a purpose. He came with this purpose. He came to redeem those under the law. He came, if we go back to where we began to adopt us as sons. He came to make us children of God. He came as the one who would set us free. And think about that. We often talk about Christ setting us free. And he does set us free from our sins. But Christ not only sets us free, he makes us sons of God. So we're not just set free. We're not just said the death sentence is gone. We are welcomed by God and given an inheritance. Now, let me just share with you this metaphor that Keller uses, because I think it's a beautiful meta metaphor. He says, imagine being on death row. And you're on death row for some sin you've committed. Maybe you've murdered someone and you are on death row. You know that when the time comes, you are going to be executed for your crimes. What Christ did, Keller says, is he set you free from death row. He, he commuted your sentence. You're not going to die anymore. But not just that. Not just that, it's like Keller says, Christ has welcomed you as a son of God, meaning you're on death row, not only are you off death row, you're given this medal of honor. You're welcomed as an heir, as a son, as a person who receives so many undeserved blessings. So see, Christ did not just set us free from this death sentence that was hanging around our necks because of the law. He gave us this great blessing. He gave us this relationship with God the Father. He gave us an inheritance, blessings beyond compare in this life and in eternity. Christ did not just set us free. He welcomed us and made us children of God. This idea of what Christ did is so powerful and so great that it just deserves time to sink into our lives. Think about that tonight. You are not just set free from your sin. You are not just set free and said you're no longer going to die. You are given heaven. You are given eternity with God the Father. You are given paradise, not because you earned it, but because of the free gift of Jesus Christ. You are given that gift because in his great mercy, at just the right moment, God sent forth his Son. What a gift to be given. What a position to have conferred on us, not because of our own merit, but because wholly of the merit of Jesus Christ. Set free from death row and given the medal of honor. It's amazing. And it's why throughout the ages people have tried to put this into words and they just can't. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Why should I gain 
from your reward. I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. Christ has paid my ransom, and I would add to that. He has made me, and he has made you, a child of God. That's what Christ did for us. But Paul doesn't end there. I mean, it's like we've been given all this great information, all this blessing upon blessing. And then Paul piles on even more as he begins to talk not just about the work of the Son, but now he moves in and talks about the work of the Spirit. Because God did not just give us his Son, he sent his Spirit. So let's just think about what the Spirit does. And let's read verses 6 and 7. And this is another blessing of sonship. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts. And the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. Just let's focus on the beginning part of verse 6 before we even get into verse 7. Ver verse 6, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, and the Spirit calls out, Abba, Father. There's a couple key words in that verse, and the first is the, the word call out or cry out. That's krasdon. It's a deep and profound, passionate and feeling cry. And then Abba, translated sometimes as Daddy. It reveals confidence of love and assurance. You know, I think about being a father myself, the way my children come to me. Sometimes they come to me and they, they are in desperate need. They are in desperate need. They need help with some terrible situation. And sometimes, in my eyes, the situation isn't so terrible. But knowing the eyes of a child, that situation is a terrible situation. Something that is so great, too much for them to overcome. And so they will come and they'll call to me. And they'll call to me, Dad or Daddy. Because they know that my heart, even broken and sinful as it is, is for them. That I love them so much. That I would give anything for my kids, anything to help them in that situation they're facing. My desire is to set them free from that problem and to make it better. And so they'll come to me and they'll say, Daddy, help. And Paul says we can come the same way to our Father. God the Father, think about that. His heart is for us. And we can come to him with confidence, knowing that he loves us, knowing that he has given us his son, Jesus Christ, knowing that in Jesus Christ, we are not just set free from death, we are welcomed, and we are made children of God. We are children of God through our faith in Jesus Christ. It unites us as a people. It gives us this great blessing, a right relationship with God the Father again, a spirit who helps us in our weakness, who allows us to cry out with God and know experientially who we are in Jesus Christ. That's a lot, isn't it? It's a lot to digest all of this material, and it's probably even a bit too much for one session. You know, when I began to divide out these sessions, Pastor Don and I and we're looking at Tim Keller's book, and we're saying, well, we're going to cover this, we're going to cover this. We, we kind of glanced over them at first, and then over the past several weeks, as the sessions approach, we kind of look at them a little bit deeper and, and put some teeth on the, the study. And as I began to prepare for this study, I thought, boy, oh boy, that's a lot. We could spend all night probably just on verse 26 because it is such a powerful verse of Scripture. And so we ask ourselves now tonight, what do we do with this? How do we digest this, this beautiful picture of our sonship in Jesus Christ that we have been given? So let me share with you some action steps. And these are from the book that Tim Keller has written, Galatians for Everyone. And so if you have that book, you could turn to pages 101 and 102. You might want to highlight these. If you don't have that book... That's okay, too. Maybe take some notes and write down some of these action steps that you can take and that I can take on how we really allow our sonship in Jesus Christ to influence our lives. First thing, 
set some time aside to study what Jesus has done. To think about this great gift that we have been given in Jesus Christ. You know, there we have it in, in chapter 4, verse 4. When the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the rights of sons. That's a very compact picture of what Jesus did. The Gospels expand it. The epistles, like the book of Romans, like the book of Hebrews, they expand it. And what better thing for us as Christians to spend time meditating on, to spend time studying, to, to connect that study to prayer and prayer to thanksgiving. What better thing for us to focus on than the work of the Son, the gift of Jesus Christ, our Savior. You know, I saw something just the other day. I think there's 70-some days until Christmas now. I'm not sure that number. It might even be less than that. But, you know, Advent that we'll celebrate in December is a time of preparation, and that's often a crammed time for us. What if now we began to meditate and think about the implications of God sending his Son? Take time. Take time each and every day. Take time first thing in the morning. Take time right before you go to bed. Take time in the middle of the day to just spend a few minutes meditating on what Jesus has done for me and for you. Spend time meditating on the implications of verse 26 or the implications of chapter 4, verse 4. Just chew on those and allow God to make those verses fill your heart and fill your mind and then cry out in thanksgiving to God. Cry out to the Father throughout the day and depend on him like a child calls out to their earthly father. Think about that. How many times when we're in a situation, do we feel as if God maybe is too busy or that's not big enough for God? I know I have felt that way before. Certain things, I, I think about my life and I think, yeah, I don't need to bother God with that. That could not be farther from the truth. God is not bothered by our request. God is not looking down on us saying, oh, Rob, why would you bother me with that? Or why would you talk to me about that? God wants to hear from us. He's a father who delights in us, his children. He wants us to come to him. And so we should be crying out to God all the time, sharing our hearts with God the Father because the Father loves us. And we need to ask ourselves, especially around that crying out to God, what are we acting like when it comes to our relationship with God? Because there's a big difference between a slave and a son. Think about it. The slave is always afraid. They're afraid of their master. Even if it's a good master, the slave is afraid. Because the master controls. The master controls and the master is always looking down, looking for fault. Are we acting like that with God? Are we living our relationship with God in fear? Are we a slave to fear? Are we a slave to performance? Are we a slave? Or are we a son? We have assurance, my friends, in Jesus Christ. Let's live our life in that assurance. And here's that assurance. Listen closely to the words of chapter 3, verse 26. You are, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. If you have faith in Christ Jesus, you are a son of God. And if you don't tonight have faith in Christ Jesus, if you're questioning whether or not that faith in your heart is real, tonight is the night to cry out to God, to call out to Jesus, to ask for forgiveness of your sins, and to find a faith that won't let you down or disappoint you tonight through Jesus Christ. You too can be a child of God tonight. Be a child of God. Live in that promise and know the blessings that come from being forgiven, from being set free, and from being a child of God. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that through our faith in Jesus Christ, we are sons of God. Lord, we thank you for the promise that you've given us in Jesus Christ and for sending your son to set us free. 
Tonight, Lord, let us live in this promise. Let us reflect and meditate on what Jesus has done for us. Let us praise you and let us come to you with all our request. Let us come to you as our Father, as the God who loves us, as the God who delights in us because of Jesus Christ. Thank you again for these words tonight, Lord. And help us, Lord, not just to hear these words, but to put them into practice. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.